kill, killer frameworks are great. Killer apps are great, but you can't rely on them to drive language adoption. And also the reason, like, I'll just take an example, Go or Kotlin succeed is not because of a killer app. It's just focus on the basics, right? They get, these are industry languages that are, uh, they're stable and they have great support for tooling. They're solving practical pains and the language features are tailored uh, to industry pain points and not novelty. And we're live. Hey, yeah, so Scott, how's it been? Feeling better. And today I'm excited to have a discussion about uh, the business case for using functional programming in the ecosystem that honestly, I'm not too intimate with. And so I think this should be fun. And I think uh, I, such as uh, other people that are observing this video should uh, have some more insight about alternatives uh, in regards to various languages and various approaches and things to consider. So today we have a special guest, uh, John A. Degos. Um, did I did I pronounce that correctly? You did. Works for me. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I just to give some backdrop. I have been following you on Twitter for a while. Um, I know you are into you were into. I don't know if you're still into the the Scala community. You are currently the. You know, what? just go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, so I'm John A. Degos, and I've been doing Scala for about 15 years now, so a long time, back in the early days. I was one of the first commercial adopters of the Scala programming language. Before, before Spark, for sure, and I think before Twitter, or maybe around the same time as... No, I think I was actually before Twitter. So one of the early production users of Scala. And I've also been, I think, a longtime champion of functional programming and trying to both bring functional programming to industry, but also find ways to make functional programming more useful and more relevant to industry, because I think it has a tendency to be a little abstract. And I'm so happy you invited me on, on this video cast. I'm really glad to just spend the next 45 minutes or whatever chatting functional programming and Scala and CEO and whatever else whatever other interesting topics come our way. Yeah, so the the first you know, uh, question I would like to ask, and I know this is uh, something that you have uh, mentioned before, but it has to do with, you know, like you said, you don't, what you don't want is for, you know, uh, geeks and programming languages to become more abstract, right? And I think in all of functional programming, um, there is, I think, Scala in particular is very, very guilty of this and to a large extent Haskell. Um, so what are your thoughts on, you know, like, why is that important? You know, why? because I can imagine that new people who are coming up in both the Scala community, the Haskell community, new functional programmers are like, no, we need all these higher abstractions and higher other functions. Uh, 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 there's this particular feature that, that uh, F-Sharp gets clowned on higher kind of tight, right? Um, <laughs> we need, yeah, yeah, we need higher kind of types. Otherwise, F-Sharp will never, uh, you know, get its full potential, you know, things like that. So what's your, your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think that's a great question and maybe one without a definitive answer. I think there's lots of points of view on that. I think fundamentally why I try to steer conversations about functional programming languages to industry is because I believe that there are very many interesting things in the world of programming language theory. And also beyond programming language theory, sort of programming paradigm. And within functional programming, how do we structure software? Do we use category theory? Is category theory a reasonable basis for building out an entire ecosystem? And, and I think that due to the nature of functional programming, it tends to abstract, it tends to attract people who really do like theory and who like math and who like shiny new toys. And I'm one of those people, right? I'm one of those, I'm guilty as charged. I'm a mathematician. I love algebra. I love mathematics. And uh, I see the potential for uh, doing things in a quite different way 
with functional programming languages, including Haskell and Scala and F Sharp and all the other functional programming languages out there. But I do believe that if our emphasis is not on 100% committed to helping industry solve the problems that it has, then we will ultimately end up exploring some relatively niche pocket that consists mostly of, um, of topics and concepts, constructs, libraries, and features that are interesting academically. And they're interesting to geeks and nerds and mathematicians and category theorists and whatnot, but ultimately the impact that, that those tiny little pockets can have on our industry as a whole, I think is quite limited. And there's a danger that that the more we steer languages, technologies, and features towards those tiny little pockets of, you know, admittedly very interesting, very intellectually satisfying, and very interesting, stimulating um, ideas, the the more irrelevant functional programming becomes to the mainstream commercial programmer who's got to solve problems X, Y, and Z and has a limited amount of time to do it and doesn't care about any of this more abstract stuff. So personally, I think, and this it comes back to all of this being um, viewpoint sensitive because there are people, this is one thing I've come to appreciate having worked with functional programmers for 15 years is that some functional programmers don't care about industry at all. Like zero interest, they have no concern for industry. There are a lot of Haskell programmers, for example, and some Scala programmers and probably F Sharp programmers who like, they use these languages not even at, at their day job, right? They use it because it's fun and they're they're exploring, they're learning, they're leveling up. And they they, they want to do research. They want to keep it abstract. They, they want to, um, they want to explore new territory. Um, but for those of us who are, are more like, no, we, we want to take some of the best ideas here and uh, keep them applied, it, it, it's, um, it's very imperative, I think, that we, that we steer conversations towards not that world of the abstract, not those pockets of very interesting academically novel stuff, but to how can we use things in FP to help solve the problems that the everyday nine to five sort of commercial software developer has day in and day out, respecting their time constraints and their lack of interest, I would say, in FP <laughs> and, and try to build, you know, take the good stuff and give it to them in a package that's going to help them solve the problems that they have. So, John, when we talk about abstractions and academia uh, being more attracted to functional programming, perhaps, uh, than the actual, like, industry of, of business in general, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think that the first thing I think about is domain modeling, right? We, we, we model the business using a syntax that is more, for lack of a better term, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say streamlined, but, but I can't think of the word Odie, but th that caters more to how to describe the, the, the policies of a business. And at least Odie and I, uh, or maybe speaking for myself, coming from .NET, we've learned, or I've learned that F Sharp is really good at that. I did consume the book, uh, Functional and Reactive Domain Modeling uh, by Debasish Gosh, I butchered his name. But as I was learning F Sharp, I actually consumed that book, even though that book, I believe, was written for the Scala community. Mm -hmm. And it still had the same fundamentals that I applied to F Sharp, such as business equations um, and some other concepts. So to make a long story short, I guess what I'm asking is, are, are we not at a point where <sighs> marketing domain modeling as a technique for uh, developing business policies uh, within software development is is that something that we should promote further? I think so. I think domain modeling is one of those things that, like, if you look at all of the tools, tricks, techniques, and concepts in FP, 
then obviously there's a lot of very abstract stuff that puts people off and is confusing, requires them to learn new things. But then if you look at sort of basic domain modeling, like just model your domain and do that using algebraic data types. So you have your sums, you have your products, create some precise model of your domain entities, give them great names and make sure you appropriately choose either some type or product type at every point in your data hierarchy. I think that that is uh, something that uh, can very easily become mainstream. And it's one of those things that has enormous potential because it doesn't take too long to teach someone that and they can immediately begin seeing the ramifications of modeling data precisely inside their applications and inside hopefully, you know, fewer, uh, fewer runtime errors and also an improved ability to onboard people to the code base who can then look at these things and know what they're dealing with. When you have uh, a typical Java class for, not to pick on Java, you can do this in any programming language, but you have a Java class, right? And you've got 20 fields and, you know, in 20% of cases, three, these three fields are null. And in another 20% of cases, it's these other three fields that are null. And then you've got, you know, a few different subtypes and some parts of your code, you're checking to see which subtype it is, and you're trying to sort of emulate poor man's some type. That causes a massive amount of cognitive overhead when a new developer is onboarding that code base. So not only can you like prevent runtime errors and make your code really just very, very precise, use your static type system to its maximum by leveraging not just product types, but some types, but also you can rapidly onboard, I think, new people to the to the team when they can look at a data model and say, yeah, I, I kind of know exactly what this is. There's no extra knowledge that I have to absorb that's not reflected in the algebraic data type. So I think that's a great example, Scott, of, of just an area where we need to double down on that. We need to say, look, FP, whether it's F Sharp or Scala or Haskell or or even, um, you know, not even necessarily functional programming languages, but like we have TypeScript and Rust and all these sort of not, not actual functional programming languages that bring us some types and give us an ability to do d domain modeling. And just teaching that would give you, I don't exactly want to put, put a percent on it, but it's a big chunk of FP. I mean, there's two big things and, and algebraic data types is one of them. You get that right. And that's a big part of the benefit that comes, I think, from working in a functional way with a true functional programming language. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, what you said was was very, very key in the sense that um, you get some of these uh, features and these features going mainstream. They can totally, you can see them going mainstream because they are valuable to businesses, right? They are valuable to, to, to companies. And one of the things that uh, I remembered you saying, and I think it's actually very true, is that there are many, uh, oh, maybe I don't know if it's many, but there are some functional programmers who aren't even interested in industry at all, right? And I think I, this is my, my thought, because one of the conversations we've had on this channel, myself and Scott, is around what can we do as uh, members of the functional community, right? To make our ideas more mainstream in the industry, right? And like to make, to in other words, to drive adoption. Because in my opinion, um, I think OOP has done a lot of disservice to the entire industry. And you can see that a lot of the things that, we're, that are even happening in the OOP uh, world is essentially rolling back some of those damages and adopting more functional uh, aspects, whether it's a Java 21 or whether it's even moving away from domain. Remember, there used to be this idea of rich domain models, right? Where you would have an object that had all the properties that you, <laughs> you ever want. Disasters. <laughs> yeah, that had all the methods that you ever want for a particular object. And we quickly realized that that was a bad idea. And as an industry, we've moved away from that to using more dependency in Injection, using abstractions and all those that kind of thing. So, um, bringing it back, right? Um, in your opinion, right? What, what do you think is? Because I know how I know that that this uh, uh, conflict between the uh, those who want you know functional languages to be more mainstream and those who want functional languages to be more abstract 
that you know uh, uh, tug and pull is there and there are some languages that have managed it better and some languages it has just gone out of control and unfortunately scala is one of those uh uh, communities and i say this i say this as someone who has to code in scala professionally on a daily basis right so we ha we do have like scala code bases that we actually maintain and you know my experience with it is that scala adoption has been falling right and it's sad because when new projects are started now especially um most of the java developers i know they are either going with java or they are going with something like Kotlin, right? So, yeah, how, how do you, you see the whole thing playing out? And what do you think the Scala community can do to steer that ship back? Because there was a period of time when Scala was doing really, really well with Akka, with um, uh, be, being adopted in Twitter and all of that. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think, interesting because I, you saw obviously Scala growing quite strongly for a while there and not just Scala, but I also like peered over the fence and into the world of Haskell and Haskell was growing there for a period of, uh, I don't know exactly how long, but at least four years, very strong sort of year over year growth. And then if you look at the landscape of things today, the functional programming languages by and large are not seeing that type of growth. And that's that includes Scala for sure, and it definitely includes Haskell. And I don't know what it's like in F Sharp. Are things different in F Sharp? <laughs> well, okay. So what has happened in F Sharp was that Microsoft was. They are not going to like what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. But for the for the longest time, right? Microsoft was very very against F Sharp. Not really against, but they did not support it. You know. It, they were actively like downplaying it. So it's almost like there was a split in the community between the F sharp people and the, reg the rest of the .NET people. But now Microsoft is now adopting F sharp more and F sharp has been seeing like growth because of that, right? Making it more first class citizen and so on and so forth. So uh, I would say that uh, F sharp saw, so I will give you my own anecdote was that F sharp saw a lot of growth in that same period of time. And I remember vividly that in terms of uh, functional programming languages, Scala was at the top, even in terms of job listings, job postings, all of those stuff. Scala was at the top, maybe F sharp, a, a, a F -sharp high school, a near second before you get to OCaml, you know, and uh, Clojure and all of those other languages. So you are right. We, we did see like that, you know, rise in terms of popularity, in terms of interest and all of that. Okay, so you actually think F Sharp's better off today than probably five years or so ago? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. But uh, but that's because you know Microsoft has finally embraced it, as opposed to as opposed to you know actively ignoring it or putting it by the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. So so I think that you know to some extent maybe functional programming is a victim of its own success just in the sense that a lot of programming languages including java itself and typescript have uh looked over and and seen the great stuff in functional programming like lambdas and immutable datas and some type of some type and pattern matching and they're stealing them they're cherry picking them one over <laughs> one by the other into the mainstream programming languages. And, and that's how they maintain, that's how they fend off competitors. I, I like to view things in terms of products, right? You have a big successful product and you're looking around at all the, the little startups who are, you know, come to take you on, but they don't come to take you on directly. They do it sideways, the, the best ones. And, and an example is like FP bringing all these new concepts that Java had no support for and were clearly hurting Java as well as some of these other mainstream programming languages. And C-sharp, like it just got started adding, right? <laughs> C-sharp has everything. They just, oh, well, well monads, four comprehend. Of course, we're going to add that. We're going to add await async. We're going to add you know, all this stuff, pattern matching, some types. We're going to add all that stuff to C-sharp. And Java is similar, a little slower, I think, than C-sharp, but it's similar. So they're absorbing these features and trying to like, and then obviously you have the success of uh, functional programming in, frameworks like react so people saying oh what if our view is a pure function from uh, state to to dom and stealing that stuff over there and sort of decreasing the argument that you need 
a dedicated functional programming language in order to do FP. As we've seen, you don't. You can actually do a good chunk of FP without a dedicated functional programming language. So I think that that has, uh, to some extent, uh, cannibalized a little bit of what might have been. If those languages had never evolved, if they had never added lambdas, never added sealed traits, never added pattern matching, then they'd be hurting real bad right now. Because everyone wants lambdas, everyone wants closures, everyone wants sealed traits, everyone wants pattern matching. So because they, they, they looked over and said, oh, we see something's going on here. We need to copy what they're doing. Therefore, that I think negatively impacted some of the adoption that FP and, and the FP languages like Scalar, they're forced to compete on their own merits. So it's not enough to have these three things that are different and new because people are slowly copying that stuff over. You have to compete on your own merits as your own programming language, not just the fact that you have lambdas, because now everyone has lambdas. So I think that um, in, in the case of Scala, what that has meant is like, uh, we had some killer apps early on in Scala, and a killer app is great for a language. So like we had Spark, and we had Twitter, which led to a whole ecosystem, and then we had Akka, and each one of those was, in their own way, a killer app for Scala and created a huge boost in adoption. Um, but you can't, a language cannot be dependent on killer apps for survival because killer apps are like sort of you know, box office blockbusters. You can't really predict them. You need steady performance, like you need to have solid hit after hit after. No one can do blockbuster after blockbuster after blockbuster. You can't build a whole movie studio or game studio. I mean, actually, they do try, they do try to build it around blockbusters, right? They, they have the hit subsidize the failure. But a programming language, I don't think can operate in that model. You need to have reasonable baseline performance. If you have your killer apps, then that's great. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, on the note of adoption, we talked to Don Sign uh, about how different countries, especially European countries, tend to uh, adopt faster, uh, F, specifically the f -sharp programming language. And I was curious if that trend um, is similar to Scala. Or is, are the European countries taking the lead in adopting Scala versus here in the United States? Yes, that's absolutely true. And it's... Uh... Yeah, I, I'm from the States. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to think of the USA as sort of being a leader in technology and in the startup scene and VC and whatnot. But it really is interesting to see that uh, the the European countries, they're, they're much more, I think for a variety of reasons, they're just more willing to use things like OCaml and Scala and maybe F Sharp. I don't know anything there, but I know with some of the FP programming languages, it, it's much more likely to be adopted over here in Europe than it is in the USA. And that was a little surprising to me, just discovering that fact that, oh, we're a little, we're doing C and C++ till the end of time in the USA, right? We're not, we're not going to touch these new functional programming languages. We're going to stick with C and C++ and Java and all the the staples of modern software development. But over in Europe, they're off deploying application business applications in OCaml and these other functional programming languages. So it's, it's nice to see that. So I'm struggling to figure out, and I'm not asking you for the answer, but what is it about European culture? Yes, I understand Europe is a, has a diverse set of countries, but what is so different about the the organizations in these European countries versus the organizations here in the U.S., where they tend to be the first movers. So I don't know if anyone has a definitive answer to that. I think there's lots of perspectives, but here's some observations of mine. Take them with a grain of salt, because I could be totally wrong about all this. But one of them is the fact that uh, a number of these programming languages were started over in Europe. So we have, like, for example, Scala and OCaml and uh, several other ones, hacks and whatnot, started in Europe. And so I think it's easier to see how they find their way into European countries and European universities. And in some places, these programming languages are taught, like in France, you can find universities that are teaching OCaml, 
Good luck finding that in the U.S. <laughs> and probably that has something to do with the fact that I think OCaml originated in, in France. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but like definitely European origin. So I think that um, that has something to do with it. But, but also there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, consulting happening over here. And um, it seems to me that it's easier when you're in consulting business. Like it's not like there's you know, 10,000 tech startups in Italy. <laughs> that That's not happening. <laughs> you know, in, in the US, obviously there's so many tech startups everywhere building products. Uh, but in, in a lot of these European countries, there's a, a lot of consulting. And uh, I think that it's easier to sort of introduce a programming language like OCaml or like a Scala in a consulting uh, arrangement. Uh, because you have more choice, you have more freedom, you have more flexibility. And, and then the other sort of pessimistic thing you could say there is that maybe the, um, and this one you should definitely take with a grain of salt, but the, the other more pessimistic thing you could say is, well, maybe American business is just more practical, right? Maybe they're just more ruthless, ruthlessly concerned with, can I hire a bunch of people who know this right away? Because right? that's one consideration that every, like if you're a CTO and you're thinking about the business, you're also thinking how easy is it for me to hire people in this city who have already been using this programming language for 10 years. And so that's one of the things that you're thinking about as you allow new languages to be introduced or say, no, you can't program in that language here. It's how easy it is to hire really qualified people who can work with that language and hit the ground running. And in, in, um, in, in Europe, not to say anything bad about these technology companies and, and and consultancies, but there's possibly not quite as much uh, uh, cultural emphasis on being ruthless and cutthroat, sort of competitively cutthroat. You know, in the USA, very mindset is we're we're going to win, we're going to do whatever it takes, we're going to win, and uh, part of winning means choosing the best technology for this, and all other concerns are irrelevant. Like you get that degree of sort of just obsession with uh, bottom line profit. And there's, uh, there's, I would say, a more relaxed, somewhat more relaxed atmosphere and culture uh, in different countries over here where there's some, there's other elements. It's not just all about winning and about choosing languages that are going to be around forever and supported forever and that have tons of developers trained in them. There's other considerations that go on uh, in some of these consultancies that could potentially end up allowing more niche programming languages to uh, to thrive at, at least more than they do so over in the USA where it's very cutthroat. So so here's a I have rapid fire questions uh, just because I have your time right now and uh, I value your your thoughts. Is our language your opinion right? Our languages do they contribute to the fabric of a company's culture? Within the context of FP, right? Like, and let let me elaborate some more. Um, could could would it be ignorant for someone to conclude that a team of Scala developers or Haskell developers have more insight into writing better code based on the constraints of the compiler and other factors than your Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, I don't know, miscellaneous languages. I would like to say yes, right? Because I'm biased, but in a, I'm not sure if it could be measured, but based on my experience of working uh, with a couple shops that have practiced functional programming, they there there is a night and I personally speaking for myself and my own personal experiences have been a night and day difference in regards to talent and thoughtfulness of 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 crafting systems. Yes, I absolutely believe that, and I think what you're seeing there is selection bias. Look at any of these programming languages and. Um, and what sort of developer is interested in using a programming language that supports the functional programming paradigm to a really high degree, like Scala or F-sharp or, or Haskell? And what 
kind of programmer is interested in an advanced static type system that enables you to sort of detect and prevent more types of bugs at compile time versus runtime. And what uh, type of programmer is interested in the ability to concisely and compactly and precisely express business logic in a way without any duplication. And uh, it's, it's a type of programmer who really, really deeply, truly cares passionately about writing correct, maintainable, well-structured, correct code that's easy to test, easy to maintain, all that good stuff. And so even though you find other types of people entering these these programming language communities for jobs or for other reasons as well, because these programming languages have lots of great features. There is a good chunk of people there who are super passionate about writing correct, maintainable, but what I would consider good code. And you don't see that, in my opinion, to, to the same degree in the mainstream programming languages. So you go to like C++, I mean, they all have their own selection bias to some degree, but like you go to the average Java programmer and and you say maybe instead of using a string to represent an email we would have a class called email that validates a string contains an email and they're like what why would you ever do that right they they look at you like you have a third head or a second head whatever um and and that's because they just don't think in those terms that's not a relevant they never thought about that in their entire life and and that's because there's not a culture of how can we leverage a static type system to help us prevent or to help us not create bugs, right? How, how can we write correct software and use our compiler's type system to help us do that? And, and there's just not that same culture. So all the people who are like that, I mean, I'm generalizing, but a lot of the people who are like that, they're like, no, no, thank you, Java. I'm going to go over here and, and do F Sharp or Scala or Haskell or OCaml or some programming language where I have like-minded people who share my same values and where the programming language gives me the tools that I want in order to write the type of software that I want to write. I, I went through the experience of um, like lead, or being a hands-on architect for a .NET project. And by default, um, John, I'm, I'm sure that you've seen this, is they create the interfaces. These interfaces intuitively know that um, the data being saved, the primary keys are integers, right? The data, the, the, the code knows that a find operation has to return a, a valid result. It, it's impossible for nothing to be found. So they just assume that these interfaces are going to return a widget given a integer as a, a primary key. And it was a really interesting response when I introduced the to the team when doing a code review and, and butchering um, the way that they structured their interfaces to have result types of maybe and to have a, a generic value for your um, for your unique identifier that you're going to perform a search on, right? And it was it was very alien to them and scratching their head. I think. After a while, they appreciate it, but a valuable lesson that I learned was people don't know what they don't know if yeah. the only tool that they have is the only go-to and there's no other alternatives to challenge uh, how you could craft a solution. And I mean, I know I'm like attacking, but my experience is it, it seems so true to me that people are a slave to, when you're a slave to one language, I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> are you, how seen you are you if you only know one approach to solving problems and you're not open to alternatives that may be more sustainable? I'll stop talking, but that was my revelation. I know. I think that's a great revelation. And also, I think it goes to show you, to tie this back to the theme of business, that sometimes ignorance, and I don't mean that in a bad way, we, we are all ignorant about numerous things, but like, in particular, the case you're mentioning, like ignorance of, we would say, new types and uh, some types, right, are responsible for companies suffering. Suffer, companies, actually, businesses suffer because their developers don't know anything about new types or some types. 
and, and not just developers, by the way, but whole designers of programming language don't know anything about some type. They never heard of Go, for example. We don't know what a some type is here. We don't never even heard of a some type. So you end up having to return tuples in Go where like uh, the, you have error and success. And if the error is non-nil, then it's supposedly an error. And, and if the error is nil, then you're supposed to look over at the second element of the tuple and treat that as a success. So businesses suffer when developers and, and programming language designers uh, are ignorant of uh, better tools that functional programmers know about and functional programmers use and are not theoretical. They're not abstract. They're very concrete. They can help you solve. They can help you write better software. And, and I think it's it's up to, uh, obviously, um, businesses to be aware that FP is, is not all theory. There really are some very useful things in there. And, and I would I would love it if, because one of the things you see in functional programmers consistently is that there's a lot of people who are passionate about self-improvement. And they are actually open to new ideas. And you and they're like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't see that before. That's, that's great. I'll, I'll adopt that thing. And, and there's a lot of sort of, you know, nine to five programmers who who um, are not really, they're not looking to, they have a different mindset. It, it's not that they're bad programmers. They're not bad programmers. It's just that they're, they're not passionate about constantly finding better ways to write software that increase code maintainability, code testability, and reduce runtime errors. And as functional programmers, we, we look at a lot of our tools as doing one of those three things. We improve testability, we improve maintainability, we reduce runtime errors. And we're always evaluating, like, can we do that more? Can we do that better? And sometimes we go overboard with that, but at least we're constantly thinking about it. And it's leading us to use some types, use new types, use all these different tools at our disposal. Right. And those three items that you mentioned, they all pretty much reduce down then reduce down to uh, cost, right? It's it's you reduce the time to deliver when you do have those considerations. And again, trying to relate this back to the, the value of, of who we're serving is to make money or save money in addition to solving whatever problem that is underserved uh, within the market, so. Yeah, so um, uh, to wrap this up, I think this will be my final question, but you mentioned the something earlier about you know scala having to compete on its own merits because uh many of the mainstream languages are already taking some of these features um yeah right now uh you can see that you know kotlin is actually like on the rise and so on and so forth and part of it too is because um kotlin where kotlin is coming from right coming from uh google um wanting to move away from using java and android for example so in your opinion like what do you think um scala needs to do to be able to compete and is there anything that scala can learn from the rise of kotlin yeah i think i think that's a great question and i think that there's a lot that scala can learn from the rise of kotlin and other languages because you know, uh, several other languages have long since eclipsed Scala, right? They, they're they blowing past Scala. Kotlin is one of them. F-sharp might be another one. I, I'm not sure. And then obviously we have uh, Rust just blowing past, all blowing past Scala. And uh, I think what we, the Scala community uh, needs to uh, learn from the success of these languages is that uh, the days of languages succeeding based on one-hit wonders are gone. That's gone. That's in the past. Uh, Scala can't count on another killer app to come along and save Scala. It's not going to happen. And, and if it does, it would just be a short-lived blip before you know things settle out. So Scala needs to compete on its own merits, and that means changing approach. And the approach that uh, has been utilized in the past was fine for the past, but going forward, for Scala to um, grow within industry, it needs to stabilize. Obviously, we, we've had Scala 3, which is a fantastic programming language. I love Scala 3, love to write Scala 3, but it's a massive change from Scala 2. And, and uh, at, at some point, there's always this tension between doing new stuff in new ways 
and making the old code compile forever. <laughs> An industry wants the old code to compile forever. And if there are changes, they need to be done in a way that is incremental rather than rip and replace. Scala 3 was a rip and replace and imposed massive costs and has cost a lot of trust. Go ahead. Okay. So I heard a couple of times uh, how gone are the days of relying on the app for uh, language adoption. And that, that makes sense. However, what about frameworks? And specifically, if we go back in history, and please correct me, uh, Ruby, to my knowledge, didn't take off until the framework Ruby on Rails was exposed. Could that still be a factor today? Or why wouldn't that be applicable? I think I think frameworks can definitely impact adoption. I think that Ruby's claim to fame is, like you say, Rails. And without Rails, Ruby would have never achieved the success that it did. Um, but also look at Ruby today. <laughs> no one's talking about Ruby. <laughs> right? but Ruby and Rails are synonymous. So they, there's no such thing as a Ruby programmer. They're Rails programmers. Um, and maybe that's not entirely fair. But the gist of that is that Ruby is, is not ever going to be a mainstream programming language. It, it is what it is. And it's fine for what it is. But it's never going to be a language like TypeScript or, or obviously JavaScript or Python or in, in sort of next league categories. And, and these languages, uh, I think, ha have done something uh, more than just succeed in producing a killer framework. Because killer frameworks come and go. And they all have their lifespan. And they'll give you a little blip for a little while. But eventually, the next killer framework will come along, probably not for your programming language. So I think kill killer frameworks are great. Killer apps are great, but you can't rely on them to drive language adoption. And also, the reason, like, I'll just take an example, Go or Kotlin succeed is not because of a killer app. It's just focus on the basics, right? They get, these are industry languages that are, uh, they're stable and they have great support for tooling. They're solving practical pains and the language features are tailored uh, to industry pain points and not novelty. Um, novelty is great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but language that wants to be successful in industry has to focus on stability, features that solve industry pain points, and then really great tooling. And of course, documentation and everything else, but that has to be the core of it. And if Scala can sort of go back to the basics there and focus on stability, especially post Scala 3, because you know everyone is dreading the Scala 4, stability, right, that has to be there. Features have to solve industry pain points and not be introduced for academic reasons of academic novelty. And the tooling needs to be really stellar, like it is with uh, languages like Go and, and Kotlin. If we do that, I think Scala could see uh, uh, another rise, and, and that would be fantastic. I would love to see that. So th there is Scala Check, which is a property-based testing uh, framework. And in regards to property-based testing, for people that are listening, that's like, what's that? It's a technique for testing your assumptions and exposing edge cases. And we discussed that with the video with um, Don Syme on our The Business of F Sharp. That was the title of that channel. Within the context of frameworks, and Odie, I'm, I'm wrapping up. So well, this is my last question, or maybe second to last question. Speaking of frameworks, John, um, can you briefly summarize uh, Zio? As I understand, you're one of the maintainers. You could correct me on that. But what is Zio and how does that relate to the business or does it? So Zio is an ecosystem for building purely functional applications that um, basically backend applications for the web. So Zio is a whole ecosystem designed to help you build backend applications. And by backend, you know, modern today's modern applications on the backend uh, have to be highly concurrent. They have to be asynchronous. They have to be very efficient in their use of resources. They have to have great, very fast web server performance. They have to support REST APIs and GraphQL APIs and caching. And they interact with NoSQL databases and relational databases. They do logging, configuration management, all that stuff um, is part of what it means to build a modern sort of cloud native uh, application on the JVM. 
And Zio is a is an ecosystem designed to make building that class of application very simple and very fast using functional programming. I increasingly tell people Zio is uh, like Spring. If you've heard of Spring, the big Java framework for building web apps, but it's designed from the perspective of a functional programmer. So how would a F functional programmer do Spring? Well, it would be type safe. There would be no stringly type configurations. It would be compositional. It would have things like compositional timeouts and other types of things that the Zio ecosystem brings you. Fundamentally, Zio is designed to, there, there's the theory and the practice, and Zio is very firmly in the camp that FP needs to be practical to gain adoption. And Zio is just trying to solve the problem of building a web app more simply, and it happens to be doing that using FP techniques. But it tries to stay out of your way. You know, No category theory, no monads, no type classes, none of that stuff. Just trying to help you solve problems that you have. And as a result, it's been very successful in the Scala community. And I think uh, one of the big things to come out of that is sort of a new generation of functional programmer who they like the theory, but also they want to help the commercial programmers solve the problems that they encounter. And that's very exciting. I see that. And it's rippled over into other ecosystems. I don't know if you've heard of something called EffectTS, which is basically a port of a lot of the Zio stuff and improvements as well, but a port of the Zio stuff to TypeScript that's also rapidly taking off inside the TypeScript ecosystem. So what what Zio has done is not just obviously the Zio ecosystem, which is great. And if you if you happen to be using Scala, it's a great choice for building a modern cloud native application with an API and persistence and all that great stuff. But then over uh, in other ecosystems, it's it's inspiring um, I, I think uh, ports because people look over that and say FP doesn't have to be about monads. It can actually be about web servers too. And that's great. I think we need more of that in FP in order to not just increase adoption, but honestly, I view mainstream programming languages stealing our features as a good thing. <laughs> and also when, when libraries like React say, oh, we're going to steal that, you know, the, the, uh, the, the UI as a function from state to model, we're going to steal that. That's a good thing. So we want to get some attention, right? We want to show people, hey, there's some killer stuff here you're missing out on. Yeah, by all means, go copy language features, go copy framework ideas, make it more mainstream and accessible. But but let's find out all the ways in which functional programming can be useful to drive tangible, practical impact uh, for a company's bottom line. And that's what the Zio ecosystem is all about. So, so something that uh, came to, to mind as well is I, I'm sure many uh, people in the ecosystem are torn about it. But I think, like you said, it's actually a good thing that these things are being adopted in mainstream languages because I remember the early days of like functional programming and because many of the ideas are so foreign to the average OOP programmer at the time. It was difficult for them to adopt a functional language because it was so abstract. But now that many of these ideas are uh, moving across, right? People can now quickly understand, oh, okay, you, you're talking about the Lambda here. This is what you mean. That's a wonderful point. Because Lambdas were so confusing. Like, remember trying to explain Lambdas to people? And now you don't have to... JavaScript did its, did its mission well <laughs> with anonymous functions. Wow. And then, of course, Java has it and all of them have it now. But I think when they steal things from FP, it makes FP more accessible to everyone. And that's work that we're not doing. Like we FP advocates and evangelists were already sold. We've already drunk the Kool-Aid. We, we love FP. Um, and we can't do everything by ourselves. So when those people come over and steal the good, good things from us, they're doing our job for us, which is evangelizing FP and making it much more easy. I, I bet that this has a positive impact on adoption of sort of functional programming languages. Because once you know what a Lambda is, and you know what immutable values are because your language supports them and makes them the default, you know, immutable strings and this and that, then it becomes easier to consider embracing a language like F Sharp or Scala or whatever, as long as the tooling is there and the stability is there. And at least a lot of the concepts are going to be familiar with you because your mainstream framework or programming language stole them from FP. Right, Cody, so. I don't have anything else. Man, I really enjoy this discussion. <laughs> yeah, same here. It's same here. Very fascinating, very interesting. And it's good to hear that uh, F, F Sharp continues to do good things. And I hope Microsoft continues investing in that language because they, they built up a really, I think, solid ecosystem with .NET. And, and they've, they've not been slow to move. They've been the opposite of, of Java. They've been fast to move and fast to innovate. And it's good to see that. Yeah. One, 
Yeah, one thing that, uh, just to add to that point, one thing that I know uh, Don Saim said, um, and I think that has also been helping F-Sharp too, is he, he said he wasn't going to, like, uh, talking with the rest of the community, the focus isn't really adding new features or adding more ad advanced concepts. It's just getting the, the, the features that are already there stable, like you said, everything, you know, pretty much what you said, making it stable, making it accessible, solving industry problems, having faster compilers and things like that. I think those things, uh, people- The point the, stuff, absolutely yeah. necessary for industry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, most people in the academia don't see those improvements as being valuable, but yeah, they they are. They are. They're critical. They're absolutely critical. So good to good to hear they're taking those boring concerns seriously because they need to be taken seriously in order to see greater adoption. I think. So, so John, how do people uh, get in touch with your technical guidance, and what call to action do you have, if any? Oh, well, um, so I do consulting at uh, Zyverge. So they can head over to Zyverge.com and just fill out the contact form. Um, but basically, I do uh, architectural assistance and consulting and then sort of Zio open source implementation, development feature enhancement, commercial support contracts, all that fun stuff uh, on behalf of my company, Zyverge. So if folks are interested in, in uh, having, having more, then that's where they can go to find it. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for so, allowing me to to do that pitch by the way. I no no it's 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 really nice. Um uh because one of the things that I know we take very very seriously here is getting to know people, right? Knowing uh different ecosystems, knowing what you what you guys are all about. I think that's that's really a good thing. So yeah. Um I don't I don't think there's anything else so we can wrap up, right? So if you liked this Send us an invoice, John. <laughs> Yeah, so next time we're in the same city. <laughs> all right, all right. So, 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 yeah. So, if you really enjoyed uh, the conversation with with John, I'm going to put the links in the description. Please go follow him. Uh, yeah, I personally follow him on Scala uh, on Twitter. So, I really enjoy like reading your tweets on Scala and all those kind of stuff because I think we kind of um, agree in terms of our views on functional programming and the you know industry and industry adoption and all of that so yeah all right thank you for having yeah. me thanks you're welcome